Good morning. If you would open up your Bibles to Psalm 41. I'm sorry, Psalm 51. That would be weird if I was going to preach from Psalm 41. Psalm 51. We're actually starting our summer in the Psalms this morning. So every, every summer we take about 10 weeks to study the Psalms. And this year we're going to be studying 51 all the way through 60. So before we jump in, before we read the verse and pray, I just have a, a, a guiding question here for us this morning. I wonder if you've ever hidden something before. I wonder if you've ever tried to conceal something from someone or some group of people before. Kids, adults, young, old, doesn't matter who you are or where you're at, I wonder if you've ever hidden something. And maybe it was uh, deceitful. Maybe you hid it on purpose in, in order to deceive. And then another question for, from this morning, from the passage this morning. I wonder if you're hiding anything this morning. And I'm not asking the question of, are you hiding something physical? Are you hiding something from someone else that's physical or tangible, like money or a possession or anything like that? But I'm wondering if you're hiding anything in your heart, hiding anything in your mind from someone or from God. And the question is begged one step further as we peel back the layers, what are you hiding? What are you hiding this morning and who are you hiding from? These are the questions that Psalm 51 bring to the surface because the reality of our hearts is that they are intricate, they're deep, they're often complex, and we need the Word of God to draw us out We need the Word of God to draw out the secrets of our heart, the the desires and sinful lusts of our heart. And that's exactly what Psalm 51 does for us this morning. But the beauty of Psalm 51 is that David is hiding something. But what happens is he goes from hiding to heralding the grace of God. And by the end of Psalm 51, what we're going to see is we're actually going to end in joy. We're going to result in joy, and I hope that you see that by the words on this page, and even from the the voice that I present from the sermon, that we will end in joy. And that's because the road to joy is paved with brokenness. It's paved with heartache and grief and sorrow over our own personal sin. So we see that David goes from hiding to heralding. And that's really where the big idea comes from. If you look at your bulletin, let's walk you through this briefly. The title of the sermon is that God's grace is greater, and the big idea throughout the entire sermon is that the way to truly obtain God's grace is to first experience brokenness over sin. And in Psalm 51, as we break out this passage and try to understand it, we really see five aspects of God's grace. We see the context of God's grace, the plea for God's grace, the work of God's grace, the response to God's grace, and then the corporate nature of God's grace. Let's read the passage, and then we'll pray together. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know that my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth and the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then... Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. 
You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, in whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Let's pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father. Oh, we come before you as a deeply needy people. The truth of it is, Lord, is we don't understand our own condition. We don't fully understand or grasp just how depraved we are. But Father, we ask that you would help us to be humble, that you would help us to be contrite, that you would help us to bear our souls before you this morning, Lord, that you would stir us and that you would bring to the surface the things that are lurking beneath, the things that we've been hiding, the things that we're hardened against, the things that we're holding against other people, the things that we're hiding and concealing from you, Lord. But in reality, we ask that our hiding would be turned into heralding, that we would walk down the path that leads to joy. And, and ultimately, we arrive there by being broken, broken over our own personal sin. So, Lord, would you help us? Would you lead us? Holy Spirit, would you convict and comfort this morning? In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So we'll just jump right into Psalm 51, and we're actually going to use the superscription right at the beginning as one of our main points. So I'll just read it for us. We ha- I didn't read it in the scripture reading, but Psalm 51, it starts, to the choir master, which just means that David is presenting this to one man or a group of men who are going to be singing this psalm. They're going to sing it and lead the people in the psalm. It says, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. And our main point here that wraps all of these together is that we truly obtain God's grace by first experiencing brokenness over sin. And we see five aspects of God's grace here. And the first aspect is in the superscription, and that is the context, the context of God's grace. There's a story behind this psalm, and we read it. Pastor William read it for us this morning. And the story is of a man who has committed adultery, he has murdered, and he has concealed it. And to add insult to injury, this is the man, this is the guy, David, that God has anointed as king, 2 Samuel chapter 7, and given the eternal Davidic covenant to, saying, there will always be someone who's sitting on your throne. And we look at the context of Psalm 51 and we say, Really? This is God's man? This is God's person who he's going to use to establish his throne, establish his eternal covenant? The, the Davidic covenant that will always have a king on the throne. This is the guy, really? And as we look deeper and deeper into the context, what we see is that David is guilty. He's guilty of hiding his sin. He's guilty of concealing it. He's guilty of murder and adultery, and what the Old Testament teaches us is under the Mosaic Covenant, which David was under, which the king was supposed to be uh, administering for the people, David deserved death, the death penalty for his transgressions, the death penalty for his sin. But what happens? Nathan the prophet goes to David, and he says, listen, David, Let me tell you about two men, and I want you to judge between these two men. One man is poor, and he has one lamb. And he treats the lamb as if the lamb were a part of his family. He feeds it. It's raised in his household. The lamb even sleeps in his own bed. But then there's a rich man. And this is how David lays out the parable, the story. And he says the rich man has so many lambs, even more than lambs. He has bulls. He has everything he could imagine. But when a visitor comes to visit the rich man, what does he do? He doesn't take something from his own lambs or from his own bulls, but what he does is he takes the poor man's lamb. And immediately, David is outraged. He's angry, the passage says. It says he's, he's angry, he's furious, and he says, this man deserves to die, and he's going to repay fourfold what he stole from the poor man. And Nathan turns the finger around, he says, I'm not talking about a rich man and a poor man, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you. 
which leads David to a point of brokenness. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. For some reason, at this point in time, David's cover-up leads to conviction. His cover-up leads to conviction. And this is often how God does it. This is often how God demonstrates his glory through broken, sinful vessels. David, in this psalm, is lamenting. This is a psalm of lament and penitence. And he's bringing his lament, he's bringing his brokenness before God and saying, look, the context of me experiencing God's grace is nothing other than my own personal brokenness. The context of grace is brokenness. It's a contrite heart. It's humility. That's the context of grace. If we think that we're going to obtain grace in any other way than brokenness and humility, we have it wrong. And really what's happening here this morning from Psalm 51 is we can look at David and we can point the finger at David all day long and say, look how terrible he did. Look how much he failed. But really what the, God the Holy Spirit would intend for us this morning is he would turn the finger inward and say, I'm not just talking about David. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you. David isn't the only one who conceals and cover-ups and, and, and hides. We do that too. Each one of us in this room has done that as well. And God the Holy Spirit, in using the psalm, would point the finger at us and say, look, You've experienced all sorts of brokenness and problems in your life. And you probably lament those. Politics, uh, maybe what's on the news, what's on the headlines, maybe how other people have offended you, family members have hurt you, your upbringing was difficult. All of these things that people have done against you or sinned against you, it's brokenness and we ought to lament them. But we are so quick to lament these things that other people have done to us where we so quickly pass over the things that we've done to God. And what this psalm is seeking to teach us is that we need to first experience personal brokenness and contrition over our own sin in order to experience the joys of heralding the great greatness and mercies of God. It's counterintuitive. But this sort of brokenness doesn't come natural. That's why it's counterintuitive. And the way that God intends to exalt his people is through the experience of brokenness. So I would encourage you to consider these verses. Proverbs 3.34. Proverbs 3.34. You can turn there if you'd like to. Proverbs 3.34. Solomon writes, Toward the scorners, that is God, he is scornful, but to the humble, he gives favor. To the scorners, he is scornful, but to the humble, he gives favor. In James 4, James 4, 6, James picks up this theme of Proverbs 3, and he writes, but he gives more grace. That is, God gives more grace. Therefore, it says, quoting Proverbs 3.34, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter 5.5. 5. Peter picks up the same thing. He says, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. And then quoting Proverbs 3.34, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The picture that we see in the context of grace is that brokenness paves our path to joy. That's the principle that we need to learn, that we need to suss out here, is that brokenness, contrition, humility, paves our path that will ultimately lead us to the mountaintops of joy that God has in store for us. So the more we stifle it, the more we hide it, the more we cover and conceal it, the, the more regret the more of a heavy conscience and a heavy burden that we'll have. But really, God has given us a way to experience joy and brokenness over our own personal sins. So I would encourage you to make this the context of God's grace in your life this morning. That all of us have the opportunity right now to either harden our hearts or soften our hearts and open them and say, Lord, whatever you have for us, what, whatever you would speak to us through your word, I'm ready to receive it, and I'm ready to respond rightly. And David knew this, and that's why he didn't just start, uh, stop with the context of brokenness, or the context of grace was brokenness, but it led into a plea, which really gets into the meat 
of the, of the, of the passage here. So in 1 verses 6, David pleads to God. David pleads to God. And there are really, there are really two aspects to this plea. Number one, it's a proper biblical understanding of God. Biblical understanding of God. And number two, it's a proper biblical understanding of man. Not just humanity as a whole, but man himself. Knowing who he is and where he comes from. Knowing what he is capable of. So we see one through two, his plea regards the character of God. And then in three through six, his plea regards actually his own character. To the end of verse six. So how does understanding God's character help with David's plea? Well, let's look at verse 1, just how he starts it. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. This is it right here. This is it. His plea is not contingent on something he will do in the future or something he has done in the past. His plea is not even contingent on how other people view him and his kingdom because he's king and leader over other people. His plea, his one and only plea is contingent. It's dependent on the steadfast character of God. And David knows that. And he goes before God and he says, Listen, God, I have nothing to say other than be merciful with me. Be merciful with me. Not according to what I've done, but he says, according to your steadfast love. And this word steadfast love is in direct connection to God's covenant relationship with his people. And most most, uh, particular or most connected to the context is God's covenant faithfulness and covenant love to David. I mentioned this already that in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God comes to David. And he establishes what we call the Davidic covenant. And in this Davidic covenant, God says, look, David, no matter what happens, you're going to be my king. And on this throne, on this throne, on this Davidic throne, after you, I will always have a king. God establishes his his Davidic throne forever in 2 Samuel chapter 7. So when David is pleading with God here, and he says, according to your steadfast love for your people and for this throne, have mercy on me. So in the context, we're not really looking at this as license for leaders to sin and then then not be removed from their office. Let's just take a moment and not apply it that way. Especially in a context where sexual abuse and uh, the abuse of authority is rampant, This passage is not teaching that David should stay in his office because he's qualified or because that's the biblical or grace thing to do. But God is doing this sheerly based on the covenant that he made with David to establish the Davidic throne, which we'll get at, which ultimately leads to Jesus, the better king, the better David. But how we would apply this passage to us in God's character is we look at where we're at in terms of redemptive history. Where are we at in redemptive history? For David, he was at a particular moment in time under the umbrella of 2 Samuel chapter 7. I will establish my throne with you, and you will always have a king on the throne. But for us, we're not under this same covenant because Jesus has fulfilled it. So this doesn't apply to us in the same way, but how do we... How do we apply it then? How does this make sense to us if it doesn't apply in the same way that it did to David because of 2 Samuel chapter 7? Well, it's, it's this promise right here that God will be true to his covenant. God will be true to his covenant. So as we bring our plea to God, what do we say? We don't look back at 2 Samuel 7, but what do we do? We look at Jesus' work upon the cross. And we say, look, Lord, nothing in my hands I bring, only to the cross I cling. What we say when we come to God, when we read the Psalms, we say, Lord, have mercy on me according to your steadfast love. You've made a covenant, and you've kept that covenant by the shedding of your precious blood, Lord Jesus. Have mercy. Have mercy. This psalm directly applies to us under the messianic covenant of the coming king, Jesus Christ, who shed his blood 
on our behalf. This reminds us of the scandalous nature of grace. It's scandalous. It's scandalous. Because there's, there's no one who's too far gone. There's no sin that is too submerged. There's no sin that is too hidden from God's sight. There's no person who's murdered too much or committed adultery too much. God's grace is greater. And that's what this psalm teaches us about the loving kindness and steadfast love of God. Does it give us license to sin? By no means, Paul says. No way. But what it does is it brings to the surface, it allows us to draw out the, de the, the depraved secrets of our heart and lay them before God and say, God, this is who I am and this is what I have. And God surprisingly meets us with grace and mercy. It's scandalous. It's surprising. And perhaps why it's even more scandalous and surprising is because David, in verses 3 through 6, understands man's character. Understands man's character. Look at verse 3. It says, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. He's starting to realize, he's starting just to get a glimpse of how sinful he is. And I'm convinced, based on the word of God, that we don't even get the half of it. If you think you understand your sin or the sin of this world, you don't even understand the half of it. And David is getting a glimpse here of what he's capable of. And he says, it's going to be forever for me. That could be in reference to the consequences in 2 Samuel 12.10. 2 Samuel 12.10, Nathan says, the sword now, David, will never depart from your household. And you see the rest of the book of 2 Samuel is filled with conflict and fighting and murder. So there are consequences due to David's sin. He's never going to forget this moment in time, even though he finds forgiveness in Christ. But even further, David compounds this in understanding man's character by saying, against you and you alone, O God, have I sinned. Against you and you alone have I sinned. David understands the, the great contrast between God's justice and holiness and man's depravity. And he's saying there's a great chasm between me and you, God. And my offense is so great. Yes, I have sinned against others, but in comparison to that, it means nothing compared to how I've offended you, a holy and righteous judge. And the reason that we, we can uh, pull from Psalm 51 that David is speaking in this way because the Apostle Paul, in Romans chapter 3, verse 4, pulls out this verse. Romans 3, verse 4. You can turn there. You can write it down. Romans 3, 4. Paul pulls out this verse. And how does he use this verse? Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. Paul uses this when he's teaching the Roman church in the New Testament and he applies it and he says, look, look, even when David sinned, God's faithfulness was still demonstrated. And what Paul was saying is, even though you're a liar to the church in Rome, even though you're all liars, guess what? the righteousness of God is still demonstrated in the fact that he is just and he will execute justice. You can be certain that God is just and he will execute justice. Paul, David, understand the depravity of man and the holiness of God. Have you dealt with this deep chasm between you and God due to the nature of your sin, due to who you are by birth? due to who you are by what you've done and how you've offended God? If nothing else, this teaches us that we have nothing. We have nothing, nothing, nothing to offer. And isn't that what Paul says in the latter chapter of, of Romans 3? He says, just in case you thought you were good, he says, no one is good. No, not even one. But what is the resolve of justice comes in verse 23 and 24 in Romans chapter 3, where Paul says, God doesn't make a distinction between mankind. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're from, what your ethnicity is, what your gender is. He says there's no distinction. All have fallen short of the glory of God. 
But how are we justified, Paul says in Romans 3? You're not justified by your works or who you are by birthright. You're justified by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the propitiation who is to be received by faith. So as we even come to this passage, the Apostle Paul is pulling it out, applying it to the righteousness and justice of God and saying, look, this is fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. What David hoped to see, we see today. What David looked for, we know and experience intimately in the person and work of Christ. This further compounds the fact that grace is scandalous because God took the justice upon his own back that we deserve at the cross. Justice was executed at the cross so that we might receive grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. Grace is greater than we need grace. And Christ has given us this grace by taking the justice that we deserve, taking the justice that David deserved. But he doesn't just stay at the plea. He moves into the work of grace, the work of grace. So we've seen the context of grace, the plea of grace, and the work of grace. Grace works. Grace changes things. Grace washes. And in this passage in particular, we see grace doing, working for three things. Grace washes. Grace transforms. And grace leads to joy. It washes, it transforms, and it leads to joy. Washing is a theme here in this passage, in this psalm. And if you look at verse 7, he says, Purge me with hyssop. Purge me with hyssop. That might sound odd, and that's the reason I want to spend just a minute explaining it. Hyssop was used for ritual cleansing or ritual washing. It was an herb that was used for cleansing and washing in several different ways. Oftentimes it was dipped in blood, like in Exodus. When they have the Passover, it was dipped in blood and it was uh, put over the doorpost so that death might pass over the door. Other times it was dipped in water and sprinkled for the cleansing. And other times it was even mixed in with other things or even burned for cleansing. But the point that David really is getting at here is he's saying, purge me with hyssop. He's saying, take the depths of my heart and cleanse them, bring them to the surface. And this theme carries throughout the entire psalm. He says, wash me, wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Verse 9, hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. In verse 10, he says, using Genesis 1 type of language about creation, he says, create in me Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew within me a right spirit. And in bringing in this language of creation, he's really pulling in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And David is referencing the fact that in the same way that God spoke the heavens and the earth into existence, into being by the word of his power, in that same way, God speaks life. God speaks a new creation. God speaks renewal into the hearts of his, of, his, of his followers, into David. That God has that ability to speak life, to speak new creation, to speak renewal into the heart of the people who love him and follow him. At bottom, David is teaching us and showing us that there is hope for genuine, systemic change in our own hearts, in our own lives Genuine change. Where else would David go for washing? Where else would David go for transformation? Where else would he go for joy? He's the king. Would he go to Joab, one of his closest counselors and the person who leads his war? No. He doesn't have the authority to provide washing or cleansing. Would, he, would David go to Bathsheba? David, David know that, knows that Bathsheba doesn't have the ability to forgive sins, to wash him, to transform him. Would he go to the people? No. They don't have the ability to change his heart, to wash him, to give him genuine joy. Where does he go? The only place that he can go is to God. Because God is the only one who can create 
something from nothing. God is the only one who can create a new heart. God is the only one who can wash clean. God is the only one who can purify, as we saw, because of the work of Christ. And when Nathan comes to David, he says this. He says, you've sinned against God. David says, I need to be washed. I need to be cleansed. And this begs a question for us <clears throat> this morning. Where, where do you go with your heavy conscience? Where do you go with your burdens? Where do you go with the secrets of your heart? Where do you go with them? Where do you go with them? And one way I, I think we often see people go is they think that the world has something to offer. They think that people have something to offer by way of washing or forgiveness or transformation or joy. But really, the way I would boil it down is people can't give you what they themselves don't have to give. People cannot give you what they themselves have to give. And what I would caution us against is the fact that the world loves to play dress up and masquerade as savior. Perhaps you've seen it. It's seen in our cultural day. Every culture has uh, has fakes and masquerades that pretend like saviors, pretend like this is the answer, pretend like they can offer genuine cleansing or genuine washing or genuine transformation or genuine joy. And in our own culture, the way it comes is in affirmation or in approval or in terms of come as you are. But as we've seen with the shifting of culture, with the shifting of the times, is affirmation and approval changes every decade, every two decades, every 100 years. So if you're late or you're early to the party, it's either convert or die. And really what I want to warn us against is that the gospel, the pseudo-gospel of this world is that you will be affirmed no matter what and no matter who you are. But the reality is they don't have affirmation to give. They don't have genuine forgiveness to give. They don't have genuine genuine washing or cleansing to give. All they have is conformity. All they have is convert and be like us or die or perish. Who do we go for with our cleansing, for forgiveness, for washing? The reality is that there is only one. People will fail us at the end of the day, the world cannot give us what they don't have, which is genuine heart change, washing, forgiveness. No matter how much someone wants to tell you they can be or will be your savior, they're not and they will not be. People always fall short. People always fail except for one person except for one, in Matthew eleven, twenty-eight, 28, Jesus speaks to the people just like he speaks to us this morning. And he says, come to me. Come to me. All who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And this is the message of Jesus. Jesus loves, he loves, he loves to wash sinners clean. He loves to accept us in with open arms and say, there is grace for you here. And he loves to transform us. He loves to give us joy. He loves to give us peace and patience and kindness and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So much so that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Verse 11, the Apostle Paul is talking about all of these egregious things that we couldn't even imagine. But then he says, and look, Corinthian church, and such were some of you. But what words does he say? He says, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. If we want cleansing of our consciences, if we want cleansing of our souls, if we want to be washed whiter than snow, if we want to have things like joy and peace and patience and kindness, if we want to experience true satisfaction, there's only one place. There's only one place for it to be found. David says, create in me 
a new heart. Renew a right spirit within me. May this be our prayer. That washing leads to transformation and transformation brings us into joy. Joy unspeakable. That's why David says, may, may the bones that you have broken, O Lord, rejoice. Think about that picture for a minute. Think about that image that the bones that the Lord has broken in David would rejoice. And why is that? It's because we're created to be in submission to God. And anytime we try to exalt ourselves above God, it will lead to despair, hatred, sorrow, anger, all sorts of discontent will be produced if we, always, if we ever try to exalt ourselves above God. But David says, may the bones, Lord, that you have broken rejoice. May they rejoice. And may this be our prayer. Let's pray that the brokenness that we experience over personal sin would lead us into rejoicing in the steadfast love and grace of Christ. That, that the contrition and sorrow that we experience over personal sin, that the ways that we've offended others and hurt others and hurt and offended God, the holiness of God, would lead us into brokenness. And that we wouldn't seek to conceal or cover that we wouldn't seek to be someone we're not, but that we would just bear our souls and say, Lord, this is all that I am and this is what I have. And that we would believe that the Lord can offer true, genuine transformation, true, genuine washing, cleansing, and ultimately joy. But it doesn't stop here. David doesn't stop with the work of grace. He leads into the response to God's grace, the response to God's grace. Look at the word then here in verse 13. Then, David says, then I will teach transgressors your ways. He says, everything that I've already prayed up until this moment, all of the lament and penitence that I've already shed on this page, my heart coming forth, begging for mercy, demonstrating that I have nothing to bring. David says, when you do your work, Lord, when you wash, when you transform, when you bring joy, then and only then will I teach transgressors your ways. Then, Lord, then I will open my lips, verse 15, and my mouth will declare your praise. David is saying that the experience of grace, the experience of grace will lead to an expression of, of joy. The experience, the internal experience of grace in the midst of our brokenness always leads to an expression, expression of joy. And here we see him speaking and obeying both of these things happening as his expression of his experience. He's speaking and he's obeying. He speaks of the mighty deeds of God and he obeys his commandments. And God loves to do this. God loves to do this because he loves to showcase his people as, as demonstrations of his work in them. And I'll explain it this way. I don't know what your high school was like or your college was like, but in my high school we had a big trophy room and we had plaques at the top. And it was always my goal as a high schooler, as, as fickle and transient as I was my whole high school career, it was my goal to be on the record board for wrestling for most pins. To spoil the story for you, I didn't make it. I fell far, far short. But it was always my goal to reach the showcase, to reach the, the trophy room. Because what the high school was demonstrating is they're saying, look, whenever anyone walked in, they were saying, look, we're proud of these trophies. We're proud of these men, these women. We're proud of these plaques. Th this represents something about who we are as a school. Perhaps you've seen a trophy room like this before. It's a showcase of the glory of the school. But what God loves to do with sinners is he loves to showcase them for his own glory. He loves to put sinners on display and say, look, world, look, they're mine. And you want to learn something about who I am? Yes, I'm a God of justice. Yes, I will execute vengeance. Yes, I will execute vengeance. 
wrath because I am holy and righteous and just. But you want to know something else about me? I am gracious. I am kind. I am slow to anger. I am merciful. And this is demonstrated time after time after time as we go into the world, as we showcase the glory of God, the glory of Christ, and the message that we bring in patterning ourselves after David, then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners your, will return to you. The message that we bring is one of grace. It's not come and see how great we are, but it's come and see how great Christ is. It's not come and see and come and taste how awesome our gathering is, but come, taste, and see the wonderful deeds of Christ. So as we put him on display day after day in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our families, we say, look, you, you know something about me. You know how bad I am, but you don't know the half of it. But you know who knows the whole of it? It's Christ, and he shed his precious blood for me. Do you want to have washing? Do you want to have genuine, clear conscience? Do you want to have transformation in your soul? Just like the, the universe was created from nothing into something, let me introduce you to this God. Let me introduce you to this creator of the universe. This is the showcase that we bring as a church when we gather week to week to week. As we look around, as I look around right now this morning, what is put on display is a showcase of God's marvelous glory and grace. Why do we sing, brothers and sisters? Why do we gather? Why do we hear the preaching of God's word? Why do we encourage each other from the word? Why do we have fellowship? Why do we care? It's because God has showcased something about his marvelous glory, his marvelous grace in saving depraved, weak, little sinners just like us, just like you and me. And if you think you're far too gone, you're not. God's grace is greater. We see that here expressed through David based on God's sheer kindness and mercy, and then and only then will we offer ourselves up, our lives up as living sacrifices, as the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 12. This is your spiritual sacrifice, allowing your, your life to be glorifying to God, loving, serving, allowing the love of God, the love of Christ to work through you in the church, to work through you at your workplace, to work through you in your neighborhood and with your family and with your friends, to with those who you meet on the street. This is our spiritual act of worship. We are sacrificed to God, which he finds pleasing, which leads us into the fifth aspect of grace, and that is the corporate nature of grace. David, <clears throat> now at this end, has worked his way from the valley of brokenness to the peak of joy, all because of God's grace. And what he says, he says, God, do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. There's so much that we could uh, pull out and discuss about this, this little, these two little verses right here. But the point that comes most forward in my mind is the Davidic kingdom. We've already talked about 2 Samuel chapter 7. David's prayer here is that God would build up God's people. And here's the principle. It's that when God builds up his people, when God is working in his people, their worship pleases him. When God builds up the people, their worship pleases him. And where Israel failed, where David failed, as we can see here in this passage, there's one who succeeded. There's one who succeeded. And that comes from uh, all over the New Testament, all over. But really, in particular, the passage that comes to mind is Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verses 36 through 39. The Apostle Paul is teaching. He's teaching on the marvels of the Davidic kingdom. But then he says, you think the Davidic kingdom is great? David died. But there's one who died and raised from the dead. And who is that? other than Jesus Christ, our Savior. David says, build up Jerusalem that, that you might be pleased with our sacrifices. But at the end of the day, really what he was looking forward to was the Savior, Jesus Christ, who would sit on the Davidic throne. And not just for 
30, 40, 50 years, but forever. And Jesus still sits on the Davidic throne, ruling and reigning over his people today. And Jesus even said in the Gospel of Matthew, he says, this, this is my church. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And this is why we end on a note of joy. Is because Psalm 51 is written to us, brothers and sisters. It's written to bring us low, to break us, but at the same time, brokenness leads us into greater joy because then we experience the grace of God to its fullest and we display, showcase the glory and marvelous grace of Christ. And in doing so, Jesus is still doing the same work today through the church. Jesus says, look, you are the people of God and the gates of hell will not prevail against you. So brothers and sisters, this passage is teaching us that God will build up Jerusalem. He is building up Jerusalem. And the spiritual Jerusalem in the New Testament is God's people, the church. He's building the church up. The church will prevail because Christ is over the church. And we don't have a king who is going to sexually abuse someone or murder someone. We have a king who's perfect. And he's righteous. And he's just. And he's loving. And he's forgiving. And he's gracious. And he has the power to cleanse. He has the power to wash. He has the power to transform, and he has the power to lead us for all eternity into joy upon joy upon joy. That's what we're experiencing right now, even in the midst of our brokenness, even in the midst of our hardship, even in the midst of besetting sin. We're experiencing this in part now so that we might experience it in full then. As the church, as God's people, as those who have been marked with the seal of Christ, we will fight we will have difficulty. We will suffer. We will be broken over sin. But here it is. We will triumph. We will triumph. And that comes from the authority and confidence of God's word. We will fight. We will win, brothers and sisters. But the, the way is paved with brokenness. And the way that God demonstrates his glory is through our humility. is through our brokenness and saying, Lord, look what you've done. We pray, Lord that you would be showcased, that your grace would be showcased in this church, in my relationships, in my family, at my work. Let's pray for that now. Oh, Lord, we pray and ask you, we plead with you that your glory would be showcased to the world and to others through this church, through us individually as we confess sin, as we're broken over sin, as we experience your grace, and that experience turns into an expression of speaking and obeying your word. Lord, would you help us? Would you give us joy? Would you give us uh, a sense that we will be victorious in this fight? Help us to lock arms and love each other along the way. In Jesus' name we pray.